Hello, everybody. My name is Debbie Lynn Toomey, Tufts Medical Center's Injury Prevention and Outreach Professional. Today is I'm doing the program called Aging Strong, and it is Tufts Medical Center's Injury Prevention and Outreach Program that aims to share information and resources that empowers older adults. And this program is sponsored by the City of Quincy's Health Department. Today, we have a guest speaker, Ruth Zacharin. Today's topic is uh, prevention of gun violence. And did you know, according to the Mass Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, 2020 was the record-breaking year for gun violence of all kinds, including mass shootings. So today's guest is Ruth Zacharin, who is the Executive Director of the Mass Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. Ruth, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Such a important topic to be talking about in this day and age, especially with that particular stat that I just um, shared with you. I mean, it's this year alone, we were just talking before we went on how this year it's been such a um, a scary uh, time to be doing our everyday things, just going to the shopping mall or maybe getting a massage or going to school, going to church. And uh, it's really hard to um, let our guard down because we just never know. So can you can you share with us a little bit about um, yourself, how you got into the the specialty that you're in. And also please share with us what the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun, Gun Violence is all about. Yeah, happy to, and thank you for that. And again, thanks for having me. These conversations are really important and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And before we get started, I also just want to acknowledge we were talking before we started recording about the fact that there was a bomb threat at Quincy High today. And while that's not specifically gun violence, it is obviously a form of, of violence that is impacting our children's ability to feel safe in their school settings, uh, as well as it's traumatic for the kids, it's traumatic for the teachers, as well as for the families. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that and hold that uh, because it's, it's all very interrelated. And ultimately, this work is about making sure that every person and every child and every zip code gets to feel safe in the world. That's what our work is really about. So with that as an, as an entry, um, a little bit about me. Uh, again, my name is Ruth Zachran. I've been the executive director of the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence for a little over three years now. And I'll talk more about the work of the coalition. But prior to coming to gun violence prevention work, my entire career was working with individuals and families affected by domestic and sexual violence. So I'm a trauma clinician by background. I've done a great deal of work with community-based, shelter-based, court-based, um, as well as batters intervention. We call it something different now, but with uh, children and adults who have experienced domestic and sexual violence. And so I come to the work of gun violence prevention with that lens, with really working with so many survivors who were being threatened or harmed with guns, uh, worked with a lot of kids in the aftermath of a domestic violence homicide, most often perpetrated with the gun. And it was really that work that got me thinking more about this narrative of guns in our country and in our communities. And um, also started to think a lot more about what we could do to prevent the trauma from happening at all. And it's really those experiences that led me to want to get involved and the work of gun violence prevention and think about how to take my experiences doing trauma response and help translate that into policymaking, culture change, and bringing folks together in coalition to push for change. Because uh, we know that what we're doing now is, isn't enough uh, to prevent the trauma of gun violence. So that's how I came about doing this work. And in terms of the work of the coalition, I'm the inaugural executive director, but the coalition's actually been around for almost 10 years now. It was founded by a group of volunteers in the immediate aftermath of the shooting at Sandy Hook with the goal of preventing such a thing from happening in Massachusetts. 
And that group of volunteers came together, was very instrumental in agitating for the 2014 Comprehensive Gun Reform Law. And then a few years later, working towards the Extreme Risk Protection Order Law, uh, which provides an opportunity for families or law enforcement to temporarily remove guns from someone that they fear is at risk of harming themselves or someone else. Um, and also did, they did a great deal of work around budget line items and making sure that violence prevention in the state is, is funded robustly. And over the years, more organizations want to get involved. And so now in our almost 10th year of existence, we have 120 member organizations from across the Commonwealth, including some of our national partners. And we have a staff of three um, and we are growing. Uh, and so we're still a small nonprofit, but we are definitely growing in impact and size, which is exciting because we know this work is really vital. And our work really focuses in four main areas with the philosophy being that gun violence is a public health issue that requires complex intervention, legislative and policy change, sustained investment in community-based solutions, as well as lifting up research and data that can help inform our work. And we also understand gun violence as a public health issue that is driven by racial and economic disparity. And to that, what we need to do, what we feel we need to do is address the proliferation of guns into communities, but also address root causes of violence and address the inequities at the heart of those root causes of violence. So our approach is very holistic. And we have, as I mentioned before, four main areas, <clears throat> excuse me, that our work falls in. One being advocacy, we still do a great deal of advocacy at the state house, both for policy change, as well as budget line items. We have bills that we have supported that are about access to guns, but also about um, root causes of gun violence, the trauma of gun violence, and the way that reforming the criminal legal system is foundational to violence prevention. We were very involved in the conversation that happened at the state house in the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision in June around guns and figuring out how Massachusetts needed to respond. And we were very involved in um, advocating for an allocation to the American Rescue Plan funds for violence prevention. We were successful at getting a $50 million allocation for gun violence prevention, youth jobs, and reentry services, which are all foundational to violence prevention. In addition to that work, we do a great deal of education and public awareness, um, you know, conversations like this. Uh, we also do a lot of public facing events. Uh, one example is we've been partnering with Create a Buzz documentary films and made the film This Ain't Normal, which is about youth violence and the frontline workers who are working to support young people and establish peace in communities. We've been doing screenings of that film with panel discussions to talk about root causes of youth violence and what are the solutions. So we do a lot of that kind of work. Yeah. Uh, we are also coalitions. We do a great deal of coalition building and bringing our member organizations together to speak in a collective voice, build power, create change. And our leadership team is very reflective of our member organizations. And then finally, we do a great deal of community organizing. We have a full-time organizer who is working in communities most impacted by gun violence, as well as doing a lot of youth-oriented work, because we want to make sure that youth voices are centered in the work that we do and that they have really input into everything, whether it's our advocacy work or our awareness work or what have you, uh, that young people are very much engaged in that. So that is a sort of quick overview of who we are and what we do in the world. Wow. That's, truly, it's a very holistic approach touching upon every stakeholders that, that can really impact and create a change. So that's wonderful. Can you um, talk a little bit more about um, root causes? What are some of the root causes that um, are really causing some of these um, violent or aggression or just all these different things that's happening right now that's leading to mass shootings. Yeah. And actually what I'd love to do is even set the stage a bit for what do we mean when we talk about gun violence? Because gun violence is actually many different things that can have a lot of intersections, but they are different things. So there's mass shootings, which you mentioned before, 
There's a violence that happens in communities day in and day out that may not get as much attention from the media and from the general public at large. Um, there are unintentional shootings. So, you know, a child picks up a loaded gun and someone ends up getting hurt. There are domestic violence homicides, which is the background that I come from. There's also firearm suicide. And I just want to touch on that a bit because that's actually the largest number of deaths from guns or firearm suicide. Um, and that's something that we really need to be highlighting in, because especially with knowing that we have a mental health crisis here in this country, particularly in the, at the aftermath, but the ongoing impact of the pandemic and access to guns with someone who's feeling emotionally in crisis really increases the risk of a completed suicide. And that's something we need to be talking about a great deal more. But in terms of root causes, you know, you know, there can be some intersections of root causes for all of those things, but also some nuances and differences. Um, you know, when it comes to community-based violence, one of the, there's actually a study from Northeastern University that shows that the variable most associated with high levels of community-based violence is a lack of social mobility. You know, so we know that communities that experience high rates of poverty have been um, experienced chronic disinvestment tend to see higher rates of uh, violence overall. And so addressing root causes means making sure that we're investing in the communities that have been most impacted by gun violence, which are often the communities most impacted by structural racism, by COVID, by all of these other factors that then further exacerbate the lack of social mobility and the other sort of economic challenges that those communities face. Mm -hmm. And the other piece that I think um, we've been talking about or thinking about a lot in terms of root causes is the, the ways that extremism and hate intersect with access to guns, too. Uh, you know, I think about mass shootings like what we saw in El Paso, what we've seen in so many different places that were motivated by hate, racism, um, extremism, so many things. And that's something that we really have to grapple with as a country, uh, because when you have extremism and you pair that with easy access to guns, you know, we have a, a situation that's really dangerous um, for, you know, folks who've been marginalized in particular, but dangerous for everyone. Um, so that's something we think about a lot. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we really want to see um, policy change. We want to see uh decreasing the flow of guns into our communities because we also need to acknowledge that we live in a country that has more guns than people. And so the access, easy access to guns is a huge issue unto itself. So I think we could go on and on about root causes, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of those things because there are many root causes to violence and there are many ways that we need to address this issue if we're gonna create safer communities. Wow, that's really staggering. More guns than there are people. Yeah, and I read somewhere that um, compared to other um, well-established um, countries, um, the United States has the most um, mass shooting. Is that true? We have, yeah, the highest rates of gun violence in general for um, the you know comparable countries. Assuredly, we also have this enormous number of guns. Mm -hmm. We saw at the height of the pandemic in particular, a huge uptick in gun sales and ammunition sales too. So unfortunately, like we already started with a lot of guns in our communities, but that rate has gone up even higher. And there's a great deal of research that shows that communities that have um, high gun ownership, a lot of gun stores available, a lot of homes where, where, where guns are there, have higher rates of gun injury and gun death, whether that be from suicide, domestic violence, homicide, or community-based violence. Um, so, you know, the data is really pretty clear about what it is that we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Wow. Why do you think the United States is the highest among other, amongst other countries who are, you know, well-developed as far as like with their rates and data in um, gun violence and gun injuries and mass shootings. Yeah, I mean, guns have been a part of American culture for a long time. 
Um, but we also have had, I think, something that has been uniquely American is a, a lot of, you know, whether it's the NRA or other or gun rights activists having this sort of narrative that guns make us safer and that guns equal safety. And the data does not back that up. The data overwhelmingly says, as I mentioned before, that the presence of guns, that easy access to guns, in fact, really increases rates of injury and death. But now there's this narrative that guns make us safer. And then that narrative has really been used to sell more guns. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have, I think, a pretty unique situation in this country with that, and also a unique situation in terms of how the Second Amendment has played out, how our laws and policies have evolved over time, um, that has made it much more difficult to fully regulate and uh, address access to guns. Um, there's some great books out there that really explore the history of the Second Amendment and how we got to this place in time. Uh, if folks are interested, I particularly recommend a book by Professor Carol Anderson called The Second, which also addresses the racialized history of the Second Amendment. Um, and it really helps you understand how we landed here in this moment in this country uh, in terms of how we think about legislation and regulation of guns. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Can you speak a little bit more about um, suicide by gun and how it's different, the population of people different from the people who are impacted by um, community violence um, affected or impacted by guns? Yeah, and so, uh, you know, suicide, so means matters, let me start there. So as a trauma clinician, I've had opportunity to um, assess safety and help folks plan for safety when they're experiencing an emotional crisis, I don't even know how many times. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing that work, when you know someone does have easy access to a gun, it really, it, it's very worrisome that you really worry about how can you best establish safety when someone does have access to a gun because means matters. So if somebody attempts suicide using medication, uh, they have a much higher chance of surviving the attempt than if they use a gun. Most suicide by gun ends up being a completed suicide and there isn't a second chance. And a lot of people who have a suicide attempt and survive will go on to get support and not have future suicide attempts. So part of what we think about is removing the most lethal means when someone is in emotional crisis increases the chances that they will survive and be able to get the help that they and support that they need to stabilize their emotional crisis and be able to move on with their life. But when they have access to a gun, those chances go way down. So the message that I want to keep on giving over and over again is that means matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as far as the people who tend to use gun for suicide, what population of people are they typically? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm glad we're having this conversation because this is Suicide Awareness Month. And so there are a lot, there's a lot of awareness materials happening. We have new resources for folks who are feeling emotional crisis. So nobody should feel they have, uh, that without someone to reach out to because those resources are available with the 988 line in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but we're seeing it, historically older white men have been the population most at risk of suicide by firearm. So it's also been a lot of concerns in the veteran population uh, because you know veterans will often have access to guns. Um, but we are seeing rising rates of firearm suicide in young people, particularly young black men. So some of the demographics are changing. We've also been in conversation with some researchers at Boston College. Um, we'll be highlighting some of this in our next quarterly meeting who have been looking at rates of gun carrying in young people across the country 
and finding that young people um, in, you know, rural, more white communities are carrying guns at higher and higher rates. And so that also makes us concerned about the potential for, you know, violence in all sorts of places, but also risk of suicide. Wow. Wow. We have a lot of work to do. Yeah, definitely. Oh, my gosh. I remember when I was a little girl in the Philippines, my dad um, in the Philippines, you're the homeowner or you're allowed the mail. I can have a gun. And if there was somebody who was trespassing the home, you had the right as the homeowner to shoot them. And I remember from time to time, my dad would take out the gun and he would just clean it and he would just kind of take care of it. And, you know, he would let us sit next to him and he would just take care of it like something that's really precious and valuable. And also he would take us when he would um, go to the shooting range. And so indirectly, he's teaching us to really respect gun and how powerful it is and how it's important to know how to handle it, how to take it apart, how to use it. And so it makes me wonder, you know, um, as far as guns concerned, I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's held to that. Um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I don't know if people are really honoring it um, and really thinking that this is something that could really take somebody's life. And um, can you speak a little bit more about um, how people can access guns and what type of trainings uh, that you know are out there for people who do purchase guns? Are there certain um, procedures that people normally have to take if they, if or when they want to buy a gun to ensure that they are, you know, safe to carry it? Yeah, Debbie, thank you for sharing that experience. I appreciate hearing about that. You know, it really speaks to your family's approach to sort of thinking about this gun with care and concern and understanding of the impact. And one of the things that we also talk about a lot, and we have these laws on the books in Massachusetts, is the importance of safe storage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have a gun, if you own a gun, whatever your reason is for owning a gun, if it is stored and secured, safely, the chances of an unintentional shooting go way down because it's locked up. It's kept in a place where something unintentional can't happen and someone can't get hurt. So, you know, I think really how you hold that gun in your household, and I mean that in all sorts of ways, mm -hmm. has makes a real difference in um, the potential for harm. Um, and in Massachusetts, we do have strict guidelines around being able to get a license and then how you're then what training you go through as a part of that process. One of the things that we are looking at is um, even shoring up that training more with what's called live fire training. So somebody actually has to, you know, for real shoot a gun before they complete their process of training to get their license, which is not something we currently have. Um, and so that's something that we are, are looking at uh, trying to get Massachusetts to do just to add an additional layer of training to their process of being licensed to carry because we want people to be as prepared as possible and really understand the implications of what they are, are getting themselves into. What we saw during uh, the height of the pandemic, not as much in Massachusetts because we have stricter guidelines around this. But in other states, when um, there are a lot of first-time gun buyers who were going out and, and accessing guns. Um, and so those are folks who may not have any training and don't have a background. And when I talk to folks who have, you know, a, a, have been in the, the, in the military, have had this training and sort of talk about, like, I, I got all this training to handle this gun. And it makes me worry about folks who are just accessing guns without having that level of training and the potential for harm unintentional harm uh, that can happen because of that. Mm -hmm. I just, as you're talking, I think about, um, you know, when we want to start driving, we have to take, um, we, go, we have to go to school for it, driver school, and we have to attend the classes and we have to take the test, the written test, and then we need to kind of 
be, we have to pass the actual driving um, test itself. Do we have something similar for like that in the state or, and also maybe do other states have something like that? That's kind of equivalent to a driver's test when it comes to owning a gun. Yeah. So, you know, different states work very differently and that's why So a couple of things. One is what we do in Massachusetts is really important in absence of a sort of federal regulation to provide a basic level of safety. What we do here in Massachusetts is really important, but we also don't exist in a bubble. So, you know, we are impacted by weak gun laws in neighboring states and the rest of the country. So, you know, we do have a a pretty clear process around what training looks like to get a license in Massachusetts one could argue it, it's not as involved as the, you know, as a parent who just a couple of years ago supported my kids through the process of getting their driver's license and all of the practice, because you have all these hours mm-hmm. where someone's in the car with you as you're practicing. There's, in my mind, it's not the same kind of thing for getting a license to have a gun as it is to have a license to drive a car. But in other countries, you know, other, you know, other countries, other states have permitless carry where basically anyone can access a gun. We see that um, you know, in not just Texas and Tennessee, but a number of states that have permitless carry, and there's really not a lot stopping folks from being able to legally purchase a gun under those state regulations or mm-hmm. lack of regulations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can we jump into um, trauma informed advocacy? Can you share with us what that is all about? It's a mouthful. And uh, I myself really am very interested in trauma-informed care and the trauma-informed approach. And to add advocacy to that, that to me is very interesting. Can you just share with us what that's all about? Yeah, thank you for the question because it's something that I am really um, very passionate about. And so it's something that I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about. So, um, you know, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley talks about having the folks closest to the pain, the closest to the power and trauma-informed advocacy is a, a form of operationalizing that and making sure that people who have been most impacted by the trauma of gun violence are decision makers in what needs to happen for solutions. And part of the reason why coalition building is so critical is to bring lots of different voices to the table when we think about what are policy changes? What should we be funding? What should we be agitating for? That that is very much, not just informed by, but driven by folks who have survived gun violence, by frontline workers, by people who live in communities most impacted by gun violence. And that we're thinking about um, not just policies that address the trauma and prevent the trauma of gun violence, but that we're also not engaging in policymaking that can end up causing harm in other ways. So for example, we're really trying to be very aware of not augmenting mass incarceration as a part of addressing gun violence, because that's another way the harm has been caused in communities is mass incarceration. And then when I think about prevention, I think about, you know, what do folks need to be safe and well in the world so the trauma doesn't happen at all? And I think that the people who have been most impacted by that trauma are the ones who can best say what that needs to be. So I'm saying many things, but it really is about attending to trauma and thinking about trauma, but making sure that those who've been most impacted by the trauma are primary decision makers and how we respond to that and are involved in decision making from the first step. That's great. That's great. And what type of support do you have for the people who come to um, to volunteer, um, who are maybe the ones that's really the most impacted? Are, is there any level of education that you would give them to help them um, get into the advocacy realm, to help them really get a, a sure footing in how to best um share their stories and also be able to be powerful enough that they're able to navigate the system. Yeah, thank you for that question. And and I guess I wanna say first that um, in terms of the education, I feel like I'm the one who's being educated most often. I've, you know, everything I've learned about this work, I've learned from survivors. 
Um, and so the education is happening all the way, all the way around. And it's really about, you know, deep relationship building and coming together as a community, our leadership team. We spend a lot of time together and we're talking through together. And when things happen in the world, there are people that I draw on, like, how should we be talking about this publicly? And they're involved in crafting that language and crafting that response because we're, you know, in strong relationship with each other and we work together in that way. But I think what I also heard in your question was um, the the issue of survivors sharing their story in public spaces. And that's something that I think about a great deal because for, for someone who survived a trauma, it can be really empowering to be able to share that story to make a thing happen, whether it's advocacy or what have you. But it's also really hard to share your story and to share your trauma. Mm-hmm. And um, that's something that we we don't take lightly. And so as we're sort of doing that work, we're thinking together about mm-hmm. before and after and how do we support folks as they're going through this process of sharing their story um, and then debriefing. And um, even with the work that I mentioned before with the film, This Ain't Normal and the panel discussions, we meet beforehand, we plan the event We go through the event, we meet afterwards to debrief and talk about how that went so that no one's asked to lay their trauma bare and then not have support around that and not have the community of people that care about them as they are sharing those stories. So it's a a big part of our work to make sure that we are coming together in a way that feels supportive and healing um, as we push for change. Can we just go a little bit deeper into the trauma-informed um, care or approach. Um, there are people, especially children, if and when they should happen to witness gun violence, there's trauma that occurs. And can you just speak a little bit about how that particular young person can, will remember or carry that trauma and how it can impact them throughout their life. Yeah, I mean, and I think we know that witnessing violence or living in an area where violence happens frequently is also traumatic. Um, obviously, experiencing violence is traumatic, but even if you have not been physically harmed by the violence, but you're present for it, mm-hmm. that has a real impact. And one example I think of a lot is a couple of years ago now, shortly after I started at the coalition, there was a shooting that happened out of the community. It was on a street corner right by an elementary school at the time, a few minutes before the school was supposed to release students for the day. And so the school had to go into lockdown and families couldn't pick up their kids and kids couldn't leave the building. And all I could think of is, you know, how upsetting it is for these small children, because elementary school, and for their families that this violent uh, thing happened outside their school, and how are they processing that, and what was it like for them to be stuck in the building until it was safe for them, or safer for them to leave? And what does that mean for kids? And I, I worry that we're not giving children enough opportunity to name that and process that and get support around that. Um, partially because we just have a behavioral health and mental health crisis in this country, which is not enough services in general. Um, but going back to what I used to do in the world with domestic and sexual violence work, we had a model called children exposed to domestic violence that provided services to kids who are living at homes where domestic violence was occurring, very specialized services, understanding that witnessing the violence was traumatic when have long time impact we don't have a similar model for kids who witness gun violence or in communities where gun violence is happening frequently. And so when you don't feel safe in the world, when you witness violence, when you've witnessed someone being harmed, that is something that you carry with you. Um, and that can affect children in so many different ways, their emotional well-being, their ability to learn. You know, if something traumatic has happened in a school setting, we can't just expect kids to go back the next day and learn algebra because there's something heavy and hard and awful that happens in that setting. And even if it isn't in that setting, if something happened to a child that was very upsetting and traumatic, we can't just expect them to be able to show up to school the next day and learn in the same way they did before. 
So it's really about caring for kids and knowing the impact of the trauma and knowing that they do carry it with them. And it can manifest in terms of their learning, their emotional well-being, their physical well-being, because when you carry something upsetting in your body, there's different ways your body experiences that. Um, and I think just as a society, we need to be talking about these things more openly, destigmatizing, talking about when you're struggling with something in the world, making sure the kids get the message that it's okay to say if you're upset about something, if you're struggling with something, and that it's met with care and concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely talking is so important, debriefing and just having that constant um, reassurance that somebody, you have somebody there to talk with, somebody cares, and we, we can't really say we understand, but at the same time, you know, we're here for you and um, we'll do our best to give you the space that you need to um, process this. Very, very important. And if I can just touch on that a bit more, we may say that to a child and a child may not be ready to speak mm -hmm. and that's okay. And um, I know that the, you know, that with this being age strong, you may have a lot of folks listening who um, have young children in their life, maybe grandparents, and just that constant presence of a child knowing that you're there for them, even if the child's not ready to talk about something at that moment, you never know when they will be ready. So it's keeping that door open and giving that message. Like I care about how you feel and always want to hear what you have to say whenever you're ready to talk about it. And maybe the sixth time you say that it might be the 10th time you say that, or it might be that you haven't said it in a while and you're in the car together and all of a sudden that child is ready to talk. But you've given the message that when they are ready to speak, mm -hmm. that you want to hear what they have to say. And that's, I think, really powerful. Yeah. I'm, I'm so happy you said that because um, it just brings me back to, and this is quite an innocent memory. Uh, I have three boys. And um, it seems when they were younger, they would share more when they're maybe digging in the dirt bouncing their ball. Mom, X, Y, and Z happened yesterday. <laughs> and yesterday they looked fine. And just for them to just like out of the blue, share something. Um, it made me realize how um, our presence matters. And also things, they might say things um, in, 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 time in a space where we may not expect, but still be uh, able to give them that space, be open enough to be curious and to um, just, just have them have their say. Yeah. <laughs> and I love the word curious because I think approaching our kids with curiosity about their lives and their mm -hmm. thoughts is mm -hmm. just a great way of opening up the conversation and giving that kind of so much as I'm really interested to hear what you think. Yeah, is a great message. Mm -hmm. And if you say that and you get a little bit of an eye roll, that's okay. Because in the moment, again, they may not be ready in that moment, but they've got the message that while I'm digging in the dirt or when I'm in the backseat of the car or while we're making dinner or cleaning up from dinner, that might be the time where I can start to talk about something. And I trust that this adult in my life mm -hmm. is in fact going to listen to me. Yeah. Yeah. Presence is so important. We don't even have to say anything, just being there, just being there just matters so much because some people may not have the words to articulate what they are feeling because maybe there's just a whole smogersborg of feelings that's happening. It's hard to just say, I'm sad. <laughs> or some people might say, I'm stressed. So what, what is stress? What, what are you exactly feeling? You know, where are you feeling it? What's, what's been going on? I think many of us, myself included, if something happens, it takes me a while to even be able to name what I'm thinking and feeling about. I just have to sit with it for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think the other thing I would say to parents and grandparents is if something happens, a, if something upsetting happens at school or out in the world, yes, approach your child with curiosity about what they think about it. But they may not even have the words in that moment to be able to say what that is. Um, so it might take a day or three days or a week 
before they're really ready to be able to process what happened. And it brings up too, you know, we've been talking more specifically about gun violence or violence that our kids may witness or experience in, in life. But we know our kids are hearing about violence in the news all the time. And we cannot insulate them from that. That's just not the reality of the situation, particularly for any child old enough to have a device. They are going to be hearing about violence all the time because the news is constantly filled with it. And unfortunately, we've had a lot of violence that's been happening in our communities. And then again today, the incident to Quincy High is going to bring up a lot of stuff for kids. The second week of school, they have this incident that's happening in a place where they should be learning. So this stuff is surrounding our children and uh, constantly giving them the message that it is okay to talk about it. Cause you never know like what's going to be that story on the news that lands with our kid in some sort of way. Or there may be other stories that doesn't, that don't impact them as much. We just don't know, but constantly keeping that open, like, Oh, if you've been watching the news, what did you think about so-and-so those very open-ended questions, just inviting the conversation is another way of giving our kids the message that we do want to hear what they think and um, that it's okay to talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. It definitely, definitely giving that permission to just talk, talk when they're ready, talk anytime, text anytime, (laughs) reach out anytime. Um, A few months ago, I have my youngest is a high school student. And um, a few months ago, he texted me during a school day and my son my youngest is um he he is one of those kids that um turns off his phone puts his phone away and does not even check his phone or text until he's home for him to text me and in that text he says i love you in the middle of the day as i'm hearing helicopters around near um, his school, my skin was just like, (laughs) I was so scared. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't hear anything in the news. Um, It was very scary, very, very scary. And later on, we found out we were, we finally got some texts from the school letting us know that there's some police in the school system, uh, in the school to make sure everything's okay. But we got the full story later on. So I can really sympathize to any parents who have kids who are experiencing any potential threats, real threats, any type of danger, because it's so scary. You just want to run in and help them. But you know that wherever they are, hopefully the system has been structured that they are safe. It's really, it's scary. It's really scary. Yeah. And I think, and I'm sorry that that happens, you know, that is really scary, scary for your kids, scary for you. And yeah. that's unfortunately what too many families are dealing with. Um, I'm just worried about, you know, it's particularly in communities that are most impacted by gun violence parents who have to worry about letting their kids play outside, mm-hmm. which is not the way anyone should have to parent their children. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, in, in this, in this conversation about how we talk to our kids about it, we can't, t- we can't guarantee them that the world is a safe place. We just can't do that. But if we can tell them that this is a safe place to talk about the things that feel scary, that is a gift that we can give to our, the kids in our lives. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Because certainly we don't want our kids to live in fear, but we do want them to be educated enough, or at least know that in case something happens that hopefully, you know, they're able to make it home uh, and be able to have that space and the adult presence to um, help them feel as safe as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what else is coming up as far as the Mass Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence? Any upcoming projects or any type of advocacy work that you want to share with the public? Yeah, thank you for that. So we do, uh, at the end of September, 
We have a quarterly meeting coming up. It's Thursday, the 29th. We'll have information on our website about that. We'll be talking about that recent research about youth trends and gun carrying. Mm -hmm. Uh, Later on in the fall, October 24th, is our annual Peace MVP Awards, where we celebrate the work of the coalition, the work of activists who have moved mountains to prevent violence this year. We're honoring coach Dennis Wilson, longtime basketball coach at Madison Park High School in Boston, co-founder of the Boston Raiders football program, and co-producer of the film This Ain't Normal, which I've talked about uh, for his work and um, supporting young people. Uh, And then after that, we're really going to be gearing up for the next legislative session, which will start in January. We had a response to the Supreme Court decision on Bruin, which was very important for keeping our laws strong in Massachusetts that got passed at the end of the last legislative session, formal legislative session. Um, And then state house leaders talked about um, that we would be coming back at the beginning of the session and passing a comprehensive bill to further strengthen our gun laws in Massachusetts. And we are busy working on what that, what we feel like that should look like. And so there will be some advocacy that will be needed at the beginning of the legislative session to get that passed. And we'll also be picking our legislative priorities for the rest of the session so that we can address the guns themselves and also do some policy work that will address root causes of gun violence. So folks are interested in keeping up to speed with what we're doing and getting our action alerts. If they want to participate, they can go to our website, which is www.mapreventgunviolence.org and sign up for our action alerts. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, a question about um, your advocacy work. Does it matter or how does um, the fact that Maybe more Republicans are in in government to um, are in place to um, enforce the law. Uh, how is that different from having more Republicans versus more Democrats enforcing the law in the state? Is is the work of gun violence prevention the same, or is it harder with one versus the other? So our focus is really Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We have dipped our toes into some of the national advocacy, but really our focus is in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And Massachusetts already has, um, compared to most states in the country, pretty strong gun laws. However, we can still improve and still strengthen them and do more to address root causes because we still have gun violence in Massachusetts and one death is too many. Mm -hmm. So, and for us, it really is about preventing trauma and making sure that every child in every zip code gets to feel safe. Mm-hmm. And that's the message, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or independent, we should all be able to agree that mm-hmm. children should have the right to be safe in their communities. They should be have the right to be safe at school, walking to school and playing outside after school. I think that is just a, a basic core value that we can all agree on, no matter what our political leanings might be, whether we agree on certain policies or not, we should be able to agree on that as a core value. So that's how we approach it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in, you know, in Massachusetts, we do have a democratic supermajority that hasn't changed with the re- or with the primaries. Obviously, we'll see what the general election happens, but it's likely to, to remain the same. Um, but really, our approach is again, no matter your political affiliation, we should work together to make sure that every child in every community gets to be safe. Mm, definitely well said, well said. Um, as far as um, this program is Aging Strong and we wanna be able to share more information about how the older population can support each other, uh, maybe support their friends who may be impacted by gun violence. How, what are, what are some um, your suggestions and how we could do that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think just having the conversation so folks are watching this, talk to your friends about what you saw with this program and how it landed with you and some of the things that you are thinking about. As I always say, violence thrives in silence. So the more that we are talking openly about it, the more that we can promote healing um, and promote care and concern. And so just bringing up the conversation, this is what I learned, and this was what was interesting to me, or this is what I'm thinking about, 
is a way that we can spread the word and start those conversations or with your grandchildren. Oh, I watched this program about so-and-so. What do you think about it is a way to start that conversation that we talked about. Um, but we also know that there has historically been a higher rate of firearm suicide amongst uh, the older population. And so being able to talk about emotional well-being, being able to talk about getting support when you need it, and if you have a gun in your home, locking it away so that it is not immediately accessible, making sure that the guns are stored safely. Those are all conversations we can be having. Again, this is Suicide Awareness Month. It's a, we should always talk about this, but particularly now as there's a lot of awareness stuff happening, it's a real opportunity to open the conversation. We just need to keep on saying out loud, this is an issue that I care about and I want to talk about it with you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we've been saying mass shooting, mass shooting throughout this whole program. Can you define what mass shooting is? Yeah. It's an interesting question actually, because a lot of folks have used the definition of a mass shooting being four or more people killed in a single incident. When you use that definition, only about 1% of deaths from guns are attributed to a mass shooting. It's actually a very small number, but it also then gets away from really acknowledging the shootings that happen in communities all the time. So I'll give you, so the different definition is four or more injured as a part of a single incident. And then that's a much broader definition where you're um, acknowledging traumatic sh shootings that are happening in lots of different places, but may not get covered in the news as much as the shootings that happen in a, at a school or a public space, movie theater, yoga studio, church or synagogue, those uh, mosque, those kinds of spaces. Mm -hmm. So there was a uh, sort of narrative that during the height of the pandemic that the number of mass shootings went down. That's if you use the first definition. If you use the second definition, that actually wasn't the case. Wow. So, um, so I think how we define the issue is really important. And definitions are tricky. So in a, before the pandemic, in a community not far from Quincy in Abington, there was a shooting where a man um, shot his wife and his children and himself with five fatalities. And so that is a domestic violence homicide. That is a murder-suicide. That is a mass shooting. So just actually some nuances and complications for how we define something and how we talk about it. Um, so I think we need to talk about an incident like that as all of those things, because otherwise it's getting, there's important pieces that are getting lost in the conversation. That's a very good point because that's going to impact, that's going to impact the data, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Right. And so when folks say we don't have mass shootings in Massachusetts, that's not actually the case. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so how can that be? How can that be fixed so that the people who are recording the, re the recorders are actually using the right code, the right terminology, the, the right, well, and, and I'm not saying the right, maybe the correct um, terminology, term the correct code so that in that particular incidence, it gets recorded in three different situations, right? The suicide, domestic violence, and mass shooting. Yeah. And, you know, there's a great resource, a public database called the Gun Violence Archive that is that captures so much information about the impact of gun violence around the country. And they are really helping us quantify what this looks like. And then some of it is, you know, if you see something in the media and you're recognizing that the language really isn't descriptive or isn't telling the full story or is, you know, very punitive, as a, which is like a whole other topic to talk about writing into that paper and pushing back on that and naming that so that, you know, we need to talk about the fact that there was a mass shooting in Massachusetts um, because we, we are not immune from gun violence in Massachusetts. And we, we have to keep on naming. We can't address a problem that we're not naming. Mm, very good point. Do you think, do you, do you think clinicians should add in their intake form when they see a new patient or even when they're seeing new 
repeated like re- re- their own patients clientele should they add the fact that um do they ask is there any guns or do you carry any firearms especially in looking at their medical history if they have a mental health history or if they're a veteran or if they've had a history of PTSD trauma having some sort of a red alert to ask that question and would that help yeah i mean there's been some discussion about universal screening so asking everyone and then giving information about safe storage mm-hmm. so it's not meant to like be a gotcha thing or a punitive thing. It is just meant to be a, okay, let's talk about this. Do you have access to gun locks? Do you have the ability to safely store your guns and demystify the conversation that way? And there are providers who are doing that. I know, you know, my kid's pediatric office, when they're still going young enough to go to a pediatrician, asked questions like that. And I appreciated that they asked. Um, And I know that it, it, can feel like an uncomfortable conversation, but the more that we do it, the, the more comfort there is. I mean, I was involved in the beginnings of universal screening for domestic violence. And now I think it's something that people expect to be asked whether they feel safe at home. But at the time that we started doing that, it was a very uncomfortable thing. And there was you know, a lot of different feelings about it. But I think if we just ask universally is, you know, presence of guns? Do you have the ability to safely store your guns? Do you want more information about it? So it's a voluntary thing. Do you want more information, not a punitive thing? Mm -hmm. Because there are ways that that can be used, particularly racial disparities, it can get used to criminalize certain populations and other others who just want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Um, But more as an offering of information, you know, I I think that's something that we should talk about more. Definitely, we, we should. We definitely should. Yeah. So we're getting close to the top of the hour, Ruth. Is there one or two message that you want the the viewers to, you know, really digest and just really think about? And also, you know, if you if if there's any viewers out there who are really interested in learning more about your work and also how they could be a part of the coalition, if you could share that as well. Yeah, thank you. I think my overall message is we can change the narrative of guns in our society. It, we don't have to live this way and folks should not have to die this way. It's going to take a lot of work, but we can move the needle on this. And again, through a combination of policy change, sustained investment in community-based solutions and the communities most impacted by gun violence, really looking at facts and data to make policy. I think that's the way that we can make change around this. Um, And that core value that we organize around is that people have the right to feel safe in every zip code, in every community, people have the right to be safe. So I think that's the way that we can come together. And if folks are interested in learning more about us, um, definitely we're on social media as well. And so you can access us that way in the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. Our website is www.mapreventgunviolence.org. We have a lot of information on our website. There's also a way to sign up for our action alerts. So if you want to hear from us when we're up to something, and you, uh, it's a great way to get involved. Um, and so that's the way to stay in contact with us. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for being my guest speaker today because I have learned so much. And I hope the viewers out there I've learned so much as well. I'm really grateful for, you know, for you and all the work that you're doing out there for the state of Massachusetts, keeping everybody as safe as possible. I also want to thank the Quincy Health Department for continuing to support my work in injury prevention and outreach for Tufts Medical Center. And to all of you viewers out there, thank you so much. Be well and stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.